Okay, so hi everybody. Here's part two of the same lecture that we're talking about. Okay, so so far um, we've talked about how um, exothermic reactions increase the entropy of the surroundings, and we talked about the scale of that increase um, and how that is temperature dependent. Okay. So we know, based on the second law of thermodynamics, that any thermodynamically favorable process must have a delta S of the universe that is positive, right? But we have a way of measuring um, energy changes in the system, which is the enthalpy. And we have a way of um, seeing how that energy change, especially if it's um, exothermic, how that affects the surroundings, but we, can't look at or we don't have a way of figuring out what the change in the entropy of the universe is based on just the system alone right because the equation we have is this one um so the first equation that we just talked about was this one delta s of the universe is equal to the delta s of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings, right? So this one makes you have to look at both the system and the surroundings, right? And then the second equation that we have is kind of a branch off of this one. Um, actually, if I write it like this, it makes more sense. The second equation is basically describing the delta S of the surroundings, which is delta S of the surroundings is equal to the thermal energy that is dispersed by the system and the temperature under which that happens is going to affect the delta S of the surroundings. Now, the surroundings in the system are going to be in that same temperature, okay? So that T is showing the temperature of the surroundings as well as the system. So that, like, basically everything under which those conditions are occurring okay so um delta s of the like the immediate surroundings basically so the delta s of the surroundings can be described by the enthalpy change or the energy dispersion by the system and the temperature under which those that energy dispersion happens and the delta s of the universe can be described by the sum of the change in entropy of the system and the change in entropy of the surroundings. Now, surroundings seems to be basically playing a big role in figuring out whether something is thermodynamically favorable or not, right? So that's no good because we want something that just looks at the system because how can you actually track energy changes or entropy changes in the surroundings? It's almost impossible to do because the surroundings are so vast compared to your system that it is really hard to track that, right? If not impossible. So this whole thing with the equations is a super inconvenient way of figuring out if something is thermodynamically favorable or not. So um, because we want to find out if a reaction or process is spontaneous, um, without looking at the surroundings, um, we need to come up with a, another state function. And I say state function because that's important because how we got there is not important. What imp what's important in a state function is the initial and final states, right? So we need a state function that will help us figure out thermodynamic favorability, but only from the system's perspective without looking at the surroundings at all. So we have to have a method to do that. And that is where Gibbs free energy comes in. It takes the surroundings out of the perspective, I mean, out of the equation, okay? It takes it out of the equation so that we can focus on the system, see what's happening in the system, and then figure out if that process is going to be thermodynamically favorable or not. So Gibbs free energy is the answer to this conundrum that we have. So I'm gonna show you how we arrive at Gibbs free energy from the two equations that we have here now, which is not super complicated, just a kind of a logical uh, progression towards Gibbs free energy. But um, I, like to sh I like people to know how we got to a place without just saying, here's the equation, use it, okay? Because I think that helps with understanding. 
Um, but this is obviously not something that we're discovering. I'm teaching you something I've learned and other people have taught me. Um, Boltzmann and other people of this caliber did the work um, in the older days. You know, I'm not good with history of dates, but we we back sometime. Okay, so um, let's look at the equation that we have. Okay, we have deltas of the universe, this first equation, and we have deltas of the surroundings. If we just get rid of this, this particular um, term, the deltas of the surroundings, and we replace it with negative delta h of the system over t, we would end up with this, right? We'll do green because why not? You have delta s of the universe, and that can equal delta s of the system, plus if we replace delta s of the surroundings by, well, um, negative delta h, so I should get rid of this plus sign right here. If I replace that by delta h of the system over the t, then we have an expression that you can replace delta s around its width, okay? So we now have this first equation written in a way where both terms seem to represent the system. Even though the surroundings is still there, we seem to have something that represents the system, okay? But we want to make it a little cleaner, a little bit more elegant, and we kind of want to get to the official definition of Gibbs free energy. Um, and we want to show it in this equation, okay? So let's try to clean it up a little bit um, and resolve it a little bit. I think we can multiply this whole expression by negative t. And if we do that, we will get this expression, negative t times delta s of the universe is equal to, um, I'm going to put this delta h term first, delta h of the system, right, over t, um, and I'm multiplying it by negative t, right? Um, so negative t, the negatives will cancel out if I multiply this by negative t, and then the t's will cancel out, so I'll be left with, oops, accidentally wrote the t. You don't need the t there. So the t's will cancel out, um, then I would get this minus t delta s of the system, okay? So that is what we would get if we multiply the whole thing by negative t. Actually, let me just do it over here. If I just erase this, I can make myself some space. So what we did was we took this, We took this and we multiplied the green expression, um, multiplied this by negative t. Um, and when we did that, we got this um, expression. Oh, sorry, guys. My hand is conducting the whole string. So I could write it as delta t, I mean, negative t delta s of the universe is equal to um, negative t delta s of the system and the negative negative cancel out and you get a positive and this will be um, t delta h over t and these t's will cancel out right if i multiply by negative t these will cancel out and this is now positive because I multiplied by negative t. And then I arrive at this expression right here, which is negative t delta s of the universe equals, I just moved this term, the delta h to the front here um, so that um, I'm trying to make it mirror the expression for Gibbs free energy, okay? You have delta h of the system, uh, minus t delta s of the system, okay? So we are currently left with this expression. Now, here's the nice thing about this expression. This side basically represents Gibbs free energy, okay? This right side is Gibbs free energy, okay? The 
formal definition of Gibbs free energy, which I will now abbreviate to GFE, so I don't have to write all three words all the time, is Gibbs free energy is equal to H minus Ts, okay? So Gibbs free energy is defined formally as an equation, and I will explain this to you um, in simpler terms than this equation. So this equation is the mathematical or numerical representation of um, Gibbs free energy, right? But we'll try to understand conceptually. I have an analogy, it's not perfect, but it's okay at explaining um, what Gibbs free energy is, okay? It's not perfect because we're trying to describe a numerical quantity with an analogy to daily life, okay? So here, let me explain what each of the variables mean. G means energy available. Available to do work, okay? Which in our reaction sense is chemical potential energy. And then the H is basically thermal energy or the total heat content of the system. That's the official definition of enthalpy, right? So this is thermal energy or enthalpy. And this S is kind of associated with um, leftover energy. This is a terrible explanation, but it is it's one way to understand it, okay? Leftover energy, it's not the most accurate, but it's helpful. Leftover energy that dissipates into the surroundings. So that is how I define those variables. Now listen to this analogy, okay? So Gibbs free energy is basically, so let's say you have a bucket. So my first year of teaching AP, um, while I was teaching this, my brain was just going really fast trying to figure out an analogy to help with the glazed over look of students as I was teaching. And this was the analogy that I came up with and it wasn't perfect then, it's not perfect now, but it was terrible at the time. It was so convoluted because my brain was thinking as I was speaking, um, and then we figured it out together, okay? So we like made it better. And then the bucket analogy has worked after that year. Um, I think it makes sense now, okay? So far um, it has worked. So you have a bucket, okay? Inside this bucket is all of the energy content of your system, okay? So imagine a bucket full to the brim of all the total heat content of your system, okay? Now, you pour this energy out of the bucket. The energy that got poured out, that's the Gibbs free energy, okay? That's the energy available to do stuff, meaning work, chemical potential energy, okay? If you've ever poured anything out of anything, a container, so let's say water out of a bucket, you'll notice that there's stuff left over in the bucket after you poured it, right? There's residue on the inside of that bucket. That is the unusable portion of the total heat content of your system. And that is going towards the entropy of um, the surroundings and the system. It's just, it's just energy squirreled away in places um, that you can't use, okay? It's just the residue that is left over when the heat content of the system is full, if it's in the bucket, that is everything. When you pour out what you can pour out, that's your free energy. That's the amount that's available to do stuff, okay? What's left over, that is the energy associated with the entropy of that system and the surroundings that the system is in. Um, I would say the 
systems entropy. Yeah, I would change that a little bit. I would say that it's the systems entropy. That energy is there because it is associated with the entropy of the system. Oops. It is associated with the entropy of the system, but it is unusable because of that particular sense, okay? Unusable. Is that the word? That's the good? Okay, that's good. It's fine. Unusable energy that is contributing to the entropy of the system. So this is not necessarily the most accurate representation. I fully own that. But I think it's helpful to think about it in terms of what does it mean energy available to do work? It's the stuff that you can do work with chemical potential energy because the rest of the stuff is tied up doing other things, okay? Like, you know, um, if you're like investing money, let's say, or you have net worth, right? People have like liquid um, assets that you can easily just use to buy and um, buy stuff, right? O obtain other materials, but you have all this other financial assets that are caught up in stuff that you can't use. It's like that, okay? It's not usable. You can't do anything with it, okay? Because it is being used to do other things. So it's like that. That's the same as the bucket analogy, I think. Not great at finance, but you know, you, you get what I mean. So that's my analogy, okay, of free energy. So this expression, this right side of the expression is actually representing Gibbs free energy, right? So if Gibbs free energy is Gibbs free energy equals entropy minus, see, that's where the minus sign comes in. From the total heat content of the system, the entropy or the energy caught up in that entropy, which is dependent on the temperature, that stuff you have to subtract from the entropy, okay? Once you have subtracted that from the entropy, you end up with the free energy that is available for use. That is why it's G equals H minus TS, okay? The S is temperature dependent, which is why it's associated with the temperature, but you have to take that away from the entropy to obtain the amount of free energy that you can use, okay? There we go. So forget the finance analogy. Anyway, so if G equals H minus TS is gives free energy, that means delta H of the system minus T delta S of the surroundings is actually delta G, right? So delta G is therefore this little expression in my little cloud. This is equal, oh, we should use purple, purple please. This is equal to actually delta G, okay? So delta H of the system is the thermal energy that could do work, right? The delta S of the system represents the entropy based on the temperature that you can't do anything with because it's caught up doing other things, okay? Um, so delta G is equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S. Now, you'll notice that the two sides of the equation are equal to each other, which means this side of the equation is also a representation of entropy, right? But this representation of entropy is in terms of the universe, right? So on the right side, we have the system. On the left side, we have the universe. So I can say this is delta G, and delta G equals negative T delta S of the universe. You'll see that they have to be opposite in sign. So if delta G is negative, the delta S is going to be positive. And if delta S for the universe is negative, then delta G has to be positive, okay? Because of the fact that they are placed in this manner, they are going to uh, be opposite in sign. Since the delta S of the universe is a criterion for thermodynamic favorability, delta G is therefore also a criterion for thermodynamic favorability and they must be in opposite in sign. 
when delta s of the universe is positive, that means it's thermodynamically favorable. favorable. Delta g, therefore, must be negative. Okay? So, let us... I thought it would take me more than one slide to explain it. So I have a couple of blank slides. Now, let's summarize. Here is the expression for Gibbs free energy. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. I removed the, our little subs, subscriptive system because now we are talking about it in terms of the system, okay? But if you think about it, the surroundings are actually represented in this expression, okay? Here's where the surroundings are. This is the delta G of the system, right? This is the delta S of the system, but the delta H of the system is secretly a surroundings. And it's not just the surroundings, the delta S of the surroundings, it's the AKA. Delta H of the system is the delta S of the surroundings, okay? Because remember, the delta S of the surroundings is affected by thermal energy release or absorption by the reaction. If the reaction is releasing thermal energy into the surroundings, the delta S of the surroundings is positive. If the reaction is absorbing thermal energy from the surroundings, the delta S of the surroundings is negative. So within the enthalpy term of the system, is secretly hiding the delta S of the surroundings. So when you look at it, you are seeing two equations um, what do you call it? What do you call it when two things are put on top of each other? The word just ran out of my brain. Overlaid. There we go. Okay. The two equations are overlaid on each other. And so if you cross your eyes and look at the delta G expression for the system, you should see in the background behind delta G is the negative delta S of the universe. Behind delta H is the delta S of the surroundings and delta S of the system is the delta S of the system, okay? So those equations go hand in hand, all right? Now, delta G being less than zero or negative is thermodynamically favorable. That's a thermodynamically favorable process, okay? So negative delta G means thermodynamically favorable process. Delta G that is larger than zero is a thermodynamically unfavorable process, okay? Now, let's discuss four different scenarios, which you may have already um, learned last year using a table, negative, negative, positive, whatever, okay? But I don't want you to memorize the table. I want you to understand what is going on in each scenario. All right, now here's the first case. You have a reaction where the change in enthalpy is negative, meaning it's an exothermic reaction, okay? This is an exothermic reaction, right? Negative means releasing energy, and you have a positive delta S for the, um, for the system. So the system is increasing in entropy and releasing energy into the surroundings, okay? So exothermic and increasing in entropy. In that scenario where you have an exothermic reaction where you are increasing the entropy of the system, you have the best possible scenario for thermodynamic favorability. Delta G is going to be negative at all temperatures. This process is going to be thermodynamically favorable at all temperatures, okay? So the delta H being exothermic is secretly, remember, the delta S of the surroundings being positive. So. Remember the criterion for um, thermodynamic favorability based on the second law was delta S of the universe must be positive. So delta S of the surroundings is represented by delta H of the system. If the system is releasing energy, the entropy of the surroundings is increasing. The entropy of the system is also increasing. So you have two positive terms here in terms of entropy, which means the delta S of the universe must be positive. If the delta S of the universe is positive, delta G for the system is negative, okay? So thermodynamically favorable and in all temperatures, best possible scenario. Here's an example. You have an exothermic entropy 
and you have more moles of gas in the system on the product side, which means the system is increasing in entropy. This reaction is thermodynamically favorable at all times. All right, so now we're number two. You have a endothermic reaction, okay? That means you are decreasing you are decreasing the entropy of the surroundings okay you are absorbing thermal energy from the surroundings and because of that the delta s of the surroundings is negative negative delta s of the surroundings delta s of the system is negative because look at this example you are going from three moles of gas to two moles of gas. You're reducing the number of particles. You're reducing the number of microstates, right? Because number of particles going down means lower number of microstates. So this is also negative. Whoops. This is also negative. If you have negative delta S with the surroundings and negative delta S with the system, the universe is definitely going to be negative delta S. If the negative delta S of the universe must be opposite in size to the delta G of the system, the delta G of the system is going to be positive. Positive delta G means not thermodynamically favorable. So endothermic reactions that also see a decrease in the entropy of the systems is going to have a positive delta G, which indicates they are unfavorable at all temperatures, okay? Not spontaneous or not thermodynamically favorable at all temperatures because both the system and the surroundings are decreasing in entropy therefore it just can't happen okay so here is um a different scenario so we've been looking at negative positive no, sorry. Yes, negative positive and positive negative. So opposite signs, okay? And there are two different scenarios where you have negative negative and positive positive. And I'm talking about uh, the signs for delta H and delta S for the system, okay? So here's the first scenario where you bo have both things negative. So this is a negative delta H, which means it's an exothermic reaction or process, could be a process too. And the delta S is negative for the system. That means the system is decreasing in entropy, but in order to decrease in entropy, it is releasing thermal energy into the surroundings. Now, remember when we talked about giving the um, $1,000 to the homeless person versus the billionaire, right? This is the scenario where it's temperature dependent, okay? So you are releasing thermal energy into your surroundings, which means, remember hiding behind delta H of the system is the delta S of the surroundings. If the delta H of the system is negative, that means the surroundings are increasing in entropy. But what matters here is the magnitude of that increase. How big is the delta S of the surroundings? Is it big enough to overcome the negative delta S of the system? Okay, so temperature dependent. Water goes from liquid to solid at temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, at zero and below zero, right? That means that happens at lower temperatures thermodynamically favorably or spontaneously, right? It is releasing 6.01 kilojoules of energy per mole of water, okay? At temperatures below zero or at lower temperatures, this is enough thermal energy to increase the entropy of the surroundings in a way that it overcomes the delta S of the system being negative, okay? So at lower temperatures, this process is spontaneous, and at higher temperatures, it is not spontaneous. So exothermic processes or reactions that decrease in entropy are spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable at low temperatures and not thermodynamically favorable at high temperatures in the general sense, okay? So that's negative, negative. Here's positive, positive. This is a delta H for something that is endothermic, okay? That means, remember that the delta S is hiding, 
delta s of the surroundings here is going to be negative, okay? But the delta s of the system is positive. So if the delta s of the system is positive enough to overcome the loss of entropy in the surroundings, we could still have a delta s of the universe be positive and delta g be negative, okay? Oh, in the previous example, delta g will be negative at low temperatures, thermodynamically favorable, positive at high temperatures, not thermodynamically favorable, okay? So here's the opposite scenario. When you have endothermic reaction, but in that endothermic reaction or process, delta s or the entropy of the system is increasing, then we have to see where is the system getting that energy from? It's getting it from the surroundings, right? So going back to our um, analogy of the billionaire and the homeless person, let's say you are a poor person, right? Let's say you want to get $1,000 from somebody. If you remove $1,000 from a billionaire, they're not even going to feel it, right? Because they're so... Um, they're so abundant in resources, they're not going to notice that that small amount of money is missing. But if you take it from someone that has very little money, right? If you take it from someone that has very little money, they're going to feel it a lot because they have so little to start with that taking even a small quantity of money from them matters a lot to them. So think of it as um, thermal energy rich surroundings. If you have surroundings that are very hot or very rich in thermal energy, if you remove a little quantity of it, the decrease in entropy is almost negligible, right? Because there's so much disorder, there's so many microstates in energy-rich surroundings and particle-rich surroundings that removing some energy from that surroundings is not going to affect the surroundings that much. So the entropy change in the surroundings is negative, it is going down, but by such a negligible quantity that it's like, ah, whatever, I don't know what happened, right? But if you remove it from surroundings that are very cold and very energy deficient, it's going to be like, oh my God, I had such a little energy and now you're trying to remove even more of it, right? Um, and it's going to affect the surroundings a lot more. So in endothermic scenarios where the system is sucking up energy from the surroundings, you want to take it from surroundings that are rich in energy. So when that happens, if you have high temperature surroundings, the delta G is going to be negative, meaning it'll be spontaneous. But you have low temperature surroundings, delta G is going to be uh, positive and will not be thermodynamic. So liquid water evaporating into gas requires 40.7 kilojoules of energy. If that energy is coming from a energy rich environment or surroundings, it's going to happen because there's so much energy that it won't even notice it. But at low temperatures where the environment is energy deficient, you're not going to have liquid water evaporate into gas. It's not going to happen because it's just not thermodynamically favorable. Okay. The decreasing, uh, decreasing the entropy of the surroundings will be too large for the system to overcome. Okay. All right. Now, here be the table you had in honors. Um, if you have exothermic reaction that also increases in entropy, you have a negative delta G. It is spontaneous at both low and high temperatures at all temperatures. If you have, we're looking at scenario two now, if you have a delta H that is positive, endothermic reaction that also decreases the entropy of the system, it is thermodynamically not favorable at any temperature. If you have an exothermic reaction that decreases the entropy of the system, it is thermodynamically favorable at low temperatures, but not favorable at high temperatures. This is the scenario where you are giving money to the poor person versus the billionaire. And this is where you have an endothermic reaction and the delta S is positive it is thermodynamically favorable at high temperatures because that energy is coming from an energy-rich environment and thermodynamically unfavorable at low temperatures because there's just not um, the decrease in entropy would affect the surroundings too much, okay? So um, 
when delta H and delta S have opposite signs, the thermodynamic favorability of the reaction does not depend on temperature. So the first two scenarios is not temperature dependent, okay? The second two scenarios are temperature dependent when they have the same sign, okay? Um, this is important um, right here. The temperature at which the reaction changes from being thermodynamically favorable to non-favorable in these two scenarios, you can figure out at what temperature does this process become thermodynamically favorable or unfavorable. The way you find that out is by you change the delta G to zero, um, and then you see if delta G is zero, above or below which temperature will it become negative or um, is there a temperature in which it will become favorable? Okay, so that's how you would solve that kind of problem. So that's actually something we can do. Um, let me see where we are at. Yeah, so let's solve it, okay? So you have carbon tetrachloride and um, carbon, solid carbon and chlorine. I'm sorry, decomposing, sorry, it's very late. Carbon tetrachloride is decomposing into carbon and chlorine, okay? And you'll notice that it's an endothermic reaction and the delta S is positive. So you are looking at a temperature dependent scenario here, right? Both signs are positive, it is temperature dependent. So let's first calculate the delta G at 25 degrees and determine if the reaction is spontaneous. Now, I want you to pay attention to the units here. Delta H is usually given in kilojoules, and delta, um, not delta, yes, delta S is usually given in joules because the units for entropy is joules per Kelvin. You either have to convert the kilojoules to joules or you have to convert the joules to kilojoules. You have to get it to do one unit, okay, before you do any kind of um, calculation and also, because entropy is in Kelvin, you have to turn uh, degrees Celsius. Whoa, what happened if you see that? Degrees Celsius into Kelvin. So you just add 273 to uh, 25 and you'll get 298 degrees Kelvin. All right, so let's solve this. A, change color. We are looking at this reaction, I mean equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So our delta H is 95. 95 times 7 times 10 to the third joules or um, 95,700 joules minus 298 Kelvin times what is our number? 142.2 joules per Kelvin, okay. So your Kelvin will cancel out and you will get an answer when you resolve this, which is 53.3 times 10 to the third joules uh, based on my Kelvin. So 53.3 times 10 to the third joules is positive, which indicates to us that this reaction is not favorable, okay? Not favorable at this temperature, right? At 298, which is the temperature that we calculated it at, it is not spontaneous. So part B says, if the reaction is not favorable at 25 degrees, which we just calculated, it's not, delta G is positive, okay? If it's not spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius, determine at what temperature, if any, sometimes there is no temperature, if any, the reaction does become spontaneous. So let's see. The way you do that is by setting your delta G to zero. Hmm. Let's use green. I wonder if I have enough space. Yeah, I'll squeeze it in. So B is over here, okay? We are setting delta G now to zero. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Oops. Where is my delta? Okay, um, so I'm gonna set this to zero. Zero equals um, 95.7 times 10 to the third joules 
minus I'm looking for T now at which this becomes 142.2 and 142.2 plus 142.2 joules over Kelvin. So Kelvin can't cancel out now because I'm looking for temperature. So T is equal to 95.7 times 10 to the third joules over 142. Joules per that should give me six hundred and seventy-three joules cancel out here. Okay, so here's what this means: the delta G will change from positive to negative above this temperature. So this is the temperature at which delta G is zero. If I want to make it negative or make it thermodynamically favorable, I need a temperature above 600 Kelvin. Okay, delta G will be negative above 600 Kelvin. Okay, so that will be where it's up. Above that temperature is where it's going to be. That's how you solve for the temperature at which something will become thermodynamically available. Okay? Now, last thing for this is this little multiple choice question Which statement is true about the sublimation of dry ice? So let's think about what's happening in the sublimation of dry ice. You have this is my dry ice block. Okay, CO2 is becoming gaseous CO2, right? In order to do that, it must absorb thermal energy. So delta H is going to be positive because it has to absorb thermal energy, positive delta H. And it is going from solid CO2 to gaseous CO2. So my delta S is also positive. So positive, positive, which means it's temperature dependent. So let's see. Um, we can get rid of that because it's negative delta H. We can get rid of this because it's negative delta H. And we can get rid of this because it's delta H is positive, delta S is negative, is wrong. Delta H is positive, delta S is positive, and delta G is positive at low temperatures. So CO2 will remain a solid at low temperatures. And at high temperatures, CO2 will absorb thermal energy and become a gas spontaneously, um, and therefore delta G will be negative. Okay, the temperature above which um, CO2 will sublime is negative 80. Negative 80 is where CO2 will stay CO2. Any temperature above negative 80 degrees Celsius is considered a high temperature for CO2. So it's all good, okay? It will start to sublime with anything less negative than negative eight. Okay, peoples, that is the end of um, free energy. This is the third law, which will be the next.